Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. It was day two of the trial of the Coots 2, Chris Carpert and Anthony Olenek, who face a number of charges, including conspiracy to commit murder. City officials in Calgary are asking residents to cut back even more on water consumption following a huge water main break. And a number of Hamas terrorists who were allegedly hiding out in an UNRWA school have been taken out. TBN Israel's Yair Pinto has the details. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. It is day two of the trial for the Coots 2 being charged with conspiracy to commit murder of RCMP officers. Anthony Olenek and Chris Carbert were charged in connection with their involvement in the Coots border blockade back in 2022. They're also being charged with mischief. BCN's Landon Hickok is at the Lethbridge Courthouse and has more on what took place. Landon? That's right, Hal. It does appear that the jurors are receiving their first full day of evidence today. Uh, today we have RCMP Sergeant Greg Tulak who stayed in his case and what he witnessed back in the winter of 2022 in Coots. He acted as a liaison between him and the protesters, uh, so he's given his testimony today. Also, the Crown Prosecutor has approached a judge about uh, the intentions of the two men, Chris Carbart and Anthony Olenek, about what they believed would be an inevitable and violent event. If you don't remember, RCMP officers raided multiple trailers back in February 14th of 2022, where they found 15 firearms, ammunition, and body armor. And they subsequently shut down the protest the next day in coordination with the remaining protesters. Supporters of Chris and Anthony were here earlier this morning, uh, writing messages along the sidewalks here in front of the courthouse, pleading their case that the two of them are unrighteously locked up before their trial could be heard. But as we gather more updates, we'll be sure to pass them along to you. Back to you, Hal. Thanks so much, Landon. That was Landon Hickok in front of the Lethbridge Courthouse. The commanding officer of the RCMP in Saskatchewan says officers were nothing short of outstanding when responding to the mass stabbings on James Smith Cree Nation and in the nearby village of Weldon. Miles Sanderson killed 11 people and injured 17 others. The 32-year-old then died of a cocaine overdose shortly after he was taken into custody. Despite the magnitude of the situation, and the fact that things were unfolding rapidly and chaotically. It's my opinion that the RCMP response and that of our partner emergency services was nothing short of outstanding. Following any critical incident comes an opportunity for organizations to reflect, learn and modernize. The internal review report was we are releasing today was not mandated. It was something our commanding officer initiated to identify where we, as a policing service, could make improvements, and she committed to releasing it publicly to ensure we're being open, transparent to the public. There is so much that goes on behind the scenes as well. Not only are officers ensuring they're up to date with policies and training, but all the work done by those who support our folks with boots on the ground. It's my hopes that the improvements highlighted within this review help ensure officer safety and help inform our many employees supporting the front line. Another Conservative MP blasted the Trudeau government on not allowing the parliamentary budget officer to release more information on just how much the carbon tax is costing Canadians. Calgary MP Len Weber says the PBO should not be gagged and Canadians have the right to know. Canadians trust the independent and impartial parliamentary budget officer. This is likely because the PBO shows their homework instead of relying on the old just trust me routine. We also know because of the PBO that there exists government data showing what the true cost of the carbon tax is, but this Liberal NDP government doesn't want to show their homework. It is contained in that secret report. In fact, the Liberals have gone so far as to gag the PBO from telling Canadians about it. Why don't they just release the report? Except that's not what the PBO did, and that's not what the PBO said. What the PBO said back on April 17th is that they overestimated the economic cost of climate change. That means that all of those acts, the tax rallies, are based on faulty math, Mr. Speaker. This is just another reason for Conservatives to deny climate change. Police broke up a pro-Palestinian protest outside of the McGill University Administration Building in Montreal, a few hundred metres outside of the encampment that has been set up since late April on the downtown campus. Protesters occupied the Administration Building and around 200 people gathered outside chanting pro-Palestinian slogans before police used tear gas to disperse the crowd. 
A strike by more than 9,000 Canada Border Services Agency workers has been delayed until Wednesday as mediation continues. The government says 90% of the frontline officers are designated as essential, which means they cannot stop working during a strike. Union members, however, could use work-to-rule tactics where employees do their jobs exactly as outlined in their contracts. Experts say that could cause each border crossing to take longer than usual and in turn cause massive disruptions and delays at both borders and airports. Officials with the City of Calgary are asking residents to continue to reduce water consumption following a massive water main break in the city's northwest. Officials are asking for a further water use reduction of 25% from yesterday. They say water demand on Thursday night exceeded the city's ability to supply water and the city is at risk of the taps running dry. If we do not reduce our water use, we are at risk of running out. We need your help to save water for the next few days while the crews continue to work on the problem. We're asking you today to reduce your water use an additional 25% of what you reduced yesterday. And we're hoping everyone can do just that little bit more. That's a few minutes off of your shower, skipping a few flushes, holding off on your load of laundry, holding off on your dishes. The boil water advisory for the community of Bowness remains in place. We are continuing to work with Alberta Health Services to sample and test the water to ensure it's safe before the advisory is lifted. The Alberta government says construction is now complete on five new high schools. The Public and Private Partnership, or P3 schools, are located in Edmonton, Leduc, Langdon and Black Falls. Officials say... Through the latest P3 build, the province was able to save around $114 million and the schools will welcome more than 6,900 students later this fall. Under a P3 project, procurement of two or more of the project phases are integrated. Now there's also a plan to build seven more using the P3 method. Those schools will be located in communities such as Edmonton, Calgary, Airdrie, Chestermere and Okotoks. The province says those new schools will create spaces for an additional 7,000 Alberta students. Canada's latest jobs report shows more people took on part-time work because they could not find anything else as the country's unemployment rate continued to rise. Stats Canada's latest labour force survey shows the national unemployment rate increased to 6.2% in May. The country added 27,000 jobs overall last month, but the bulk of those were part-time positions. A new report by Urban Nation and Rentals.ca shows the average advertised rental price for home in Canada reached a record high in May. The study looked into monthly listings and says the record, $2,202 last month, was up 9.3% compared to a year ago. For a one-bedroom unit, the average was $1,927. That is up from 10.7% last year. While the average asking price for a two-bedroom unit was $2,334, that's up 12.1% from a year ago. Trevor Lewington with Economic Development Lethbridge says when it comes to rents across our country, our city still remains fairly competitive. It's a good news, bad news story as always. So the good news is Lethbridge was the third most affordable jurisdiction in the country, according to rentals.ca this month. So we were the third most affordable. One bedroom average rent in Lethbridge is about $1,289. So that's the good news, very affordable. The bad news is that $1,289 was actually a 9.4% increase over last year. So we're seeing almost a 10% lift in the market. We had a 2% uh, vacancy rate last year. There's very strong demand for rentals in Lethbridge. There's also not a huge amount of new supply. So for the foreseeable future, I expect those rents to continue to increase. Universal child care programs are seen by many as the answer to challenges faced by working parents. Andrea Morozik, senior fellow with the nonpartisan think tank Cardis, points out a limiting factor when it comes to the Liberal government's national child care program. The funding for $10 a day daycare goes to licensed not-for-profit care. So across the country, you have a majority of parents who are not using that type of care. Um, in some cases, maybe they didn't have access. In other cases, um, equally, they didn't choose it. They didn't want it. So we basically see the government putting their finger on the scales and saying, this is the kind of care we are subsidizing. This is the kind of care you're going to use. But that kind of care isn't available for all parents uh, with children under six, let alone children under the age of 12. 
Make sure you catch the full interview with Andrea Morozik and BCN's Jeanette Roche coming up later in our broadcast. You know, fathers play a vital role in family living. Now, God has ordained them as leaders in their home. However, dads aren't without faults. Rowan Crown, lead pastor of Amazing Grace Community Church here in Lethbridge, shares how fathers can set the example of leaning on God's strength in times of weakness. As fathers, often are doing the best we can with what we've given, what we've been given. And so it's important to remain humble and repentant, but also realize that we are not perfect and we fall short of those expectations but to quickly remind ourselves that we can go to God for forgiveness and we can go to our kids in, uh, and asking them to forgive us too. That's not showing weakness in a, in a sense that uh, we are weak people. That's actually showing a weakness and strength that we too need the Lord as we father those around us. Make sure you catch my full interview with Pastor Rowan Crown and myself coming up later in our program. More than one in three children will be sexually abused in their lifetimes. That's according to Christine Cassie, CEO of the Chinook Sexual Assault Center. The organization has rolled out a new program called Who Do You Tell? which is being implemented in schools to protect kids from predators. Cassie says the key messages are that children's bodies belong to them, child sexual abuse is never the child's fault, and to always tell a trusted adult. She says the program, which is geared for kids kindergarten to grade six, aligns with the Alberta education curriculum. Uh, it really reaches out to these kids to really uh, let them know about who those safe people are in their lives that they can tell if something is happening that shouldn't be happening in their lives. So what is a secret to keep and what is a secret uh, to really be talking to others about? And this is really to create uh, that uh, primary level of education for children and for families around issues of sexual abuse and sexual assault. Uh, that about 34% of children in the province of Alberta will experience some form of sexual abuse in their lifetime. Uh, that being the case, that means one in three may be experiencing this. So in the city of Lethbridge alone, we're looking at about 6,800 kids that could be experiencing some form of, of sexual abuse. Uh, we then uh, work with them on what those next steps are in preparation for court and getting them into the treatment services that they need, either through our centre or through some of the partnering agencies uh, that we work with throughout southwestern Alberta. According to the Association of Alberta Sexual Assault Services, in our province alone, 34% of people suffer sexual abuse before the age of 18. That stat also says that 44% of girls and 24% of boys in Alberta experience child sexual abuse. Families in need of food will appreciate the donations which will be made from drive away hunger in our city. Vendors from the Lethbridge Farmers Market will donate their leftover produce and food to the campaign, which will then be distributed to both the Interfaith Food Bank and the Lethbridge Food Bank. Uh, we have a great vendor selection this year and of course uh, we are Lethbridge's only Alberta approved farmers market which means that uh, at least 80% of what you'll find here is made, baked or grown in Alberta and that's something that we're really proud of is uh, representing the hometown and uh, the local region and, and getting those products out. It's a healthy and affordable way to uh, do some shopping and, and support local vendors, support uh, the local community. Our vendors themselves, especially the produce vendors, at the end of the day, they have leftover stock and they donate so much of that. King Smith says last year the vendors of the event donated over 6,000 pounds worth of food, which represents more than $22,000 in donations. Green Acres Foundation celebrated the last day of Seniors Week this week with a lot of entertainment and music. Donna Kozlovi, the group's CEO, says her clients have had lots of amazing activities to enjoy. One week of the year, we certainly want to uh, acknowledge all their accomplishments. We make this week a little bit special, but every week at Green Acres, we have, we have full-time activity coordinators to ensure that the residents have lots of things to do because um, we want to keep uh, them engaged. We have um, approximately 800 people living with us in various lodges. So um, we'd have about that many <laughs> participating. We, we should take a nod to and acknowledge what they've done for us to make this province a great place to live. According to Stats Canada, between 2011 and 2016, people 85 or older grew by 19% here in Canada. U.S. President Joe Biden publicly apologized to Ukraine for a months-long holdup in American military assistance that let Russia make gains on the battlefield. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky appealed for bipartisan U.S. support like it was during the Second World War. You haven't bowed down. You haven't yielded at all. You continue to fight in a way that is uh, 
It's just remarkable. It's just remarkable. And uh, we're not going to walk away from you. I apologize for the uh, those weeks of not knowing what's going to happen in terms of funding, <laughs> because uh, we had trouble getting the a bill that we had to pass that had the money in it from some of our very conservative members who were holding it up. But we got it done finally. And uh, since then, including today, I've announced six packages of significant funding. Today I'm also signing an additional package for $225 million to help you reconstruct the, the electric grid. The Israel Defense Forces say a number of Hamas terrorists who participated in the October 7th attacks, which left around 1,200 people dead, have been eliminated. The military says the terrorists were hiding inside of an UNRWA school. The Israeli government has apparently put forth another proposal, a ceasefire proposal, which was shot down by Hamas. TBN Israel's Yair Pinto has the update for us. The last 24 hours is that Hamas has rejected a proposal for the release of Israeli hostages and a long-term ceasefire in the Gaza Strip. In a memo distributed by a Hamas spokesman, the terrorist organization claims that the Israeli proposal is fundamentally different from the one presented last weekend by American President Joe Biden. According to him, the agreement includes a temporary and not a permanent ceasefire. He furthermore complained that Israel will return the kidnapped and then continue the war, neglecting to mention that this war was started by Hamas when it carried a brutal massacre of Israeli civilians on October 7, 2023. However, the statement seemed to leave the door open for further discussions as it praised the proposal made by the U.S. President Joe Biden last Friday evening, making the distinction between that proposal and Israel's terms. Well, he was arrested without charge and jailed without ever going to trial. Now he has died behind bars in prison and in the country some describe as the North Korea of Africa. Andrew Boyd of Release International reports now on the life and death of one of the leading figures in the Church of Eritrea. A senior church leader in Eritrea has died in prison at the age of 83. Reverend Gurme Araya was never charged with any crime. He suffered from diabetes and related illnesses. Reverend Gurme was one of the founding fathers of the full gospel church of Eritrea, which was banned along with many others in 2002. Thousands of Eritreans have been imprisoned for their faith since then. Some have died from torture and medical neglect. Some have been detained for 20 years. Reverend Gome was arrested in 2021. One of his sons, Samuel, has been imprisoned for his faith for the past seven years. Although they were held in the same prison, father and son had no opportunity to meet. Sources say Samuel is being kept in a shipping container, a practice long condemned by Release International, which serves the persecuted church worldwide. Prisoners are locked in steel containers in the desert, where they bake by day and freeze by night. The metal boxes are insanitary, and prisoners are subject to frequent beatings. There are thought to be some 400 Christian prisoners of faith in Eritrea. The actual figure is unknown because so many have been imprisoned without trial or without charge. Release International has campaigned for many years for Eritrea to grant full freedom of worship for all its citizens. It will continue to press for the release of every Christian locked up in its jails. Praying for the many believers locked up in Eritrea. Well, we experienced another beautiful day across much of southwestern Alberta again today, and a nice weekend is shaping up as well. A full look at the weather picture is on deck. We enjoyed another gorgeous Friday today, and a nice weekend is shaping up as well, especially for a walk along the Old Man River. Tonight, expect a few clouds with a low near 5 degrees. Saturday, it should be partly cloudy with a high near 21. Sunday, the clouds should blow out and the temperature will drop slightly to around 19 degrees. The clouds return on Monday with the mercury increasing to 23. Even warmer on Tuesday with a high near 26 degrees expected. Very nice. The sunshine will continue on Wednesday and Thursday with highs of 25 expected on both days. Now the average high for this time of year is 21 degrees with an average low of 8. 
The record high on this day was 33 set back in 1996, and the record low was plus one from 1999. The sun rose at 525 and will set at 936. Let's see how the rest of the country is looking for Saturday now. Expect a few clouds in both Victoria and Vancouver with a high near 22 degrees for both cities. Rain expected in Edmonton tomorrow with a high of only 8 degrees. Partly sunny and a high of 19 is on tap for Calgary. Light showers and 14 degrees for Regina. Rain as well and 11 degrees for Saskatoon. Winnipeg could see a thunder shower develop and a high near 20 degrees on Saturday. In the central part of the country, there should be showers and 21 in Ottawa. Partly sunny at 23 degrees in Toronto and in Montreal, rain with a high near 20 degrees. Over in Atlantic Canada, more rain is in the forecast for Fredericton with a high near 18. Showers and 16 is on tap for Halifax. Rain at 20 degrees for Charlottetown. And in St. John's, it should be mainly rainy as well with a high near 14 degrees. Canada's largest railroad operator says its workers have rejected a binding arbitration offer as a strike threat still looms. Canadian National Railway says it has put forward two proposals. One looked to pay hourly wages to workers on a schedule and the other aimed to extend parts of the current arrangement. The union has countered calling the first offer forced relocation of workers for months at a time. It also says the second would compel shifts of up to 12 hours, which is in line with regulations but increases the risk of accidents. The talks come after employees at CN and Canadian Pacific Kansas City authorized a strike mandate last month. Canada's unemployment rate ticked up slightly to 6.2% in May. Statistics Canada says employment fell in construction, transportation and warehousing along with utilities. The figure came despite the economy adding around 27,000 jobs, the bulk of which were part-time. The agency's labour force survey suggests the Canadian job market continues to weaken as high interest rates weigh on consumers and business owners. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX went down 222 points on the day to finish at 22,007. The Dow was down 87 points to 38,798. The S&P 500 was down 5 points to 53.46 and the Nasdaq was down 3 points to finish at 17,133. West Texas Intermediate Oil was down 17 cents to 75.38 US per barrel. Natural gas was up 11 cents to 2.93 US. Gold was down $82.27 to $22.93.78 US an ounce, and silver was down $2.17 to $29.15 US an ounce. Feed wheat is at $9.52 per bushel, barley is at $6.35, canola is at $14.20, and corn is at $7.82 per bushel. Live cattle were up $0.19 cents to $182.18. Feeder cattle August contract was up $208 to $254.93. Lean hogs were up $1.98 to $101.68, and the Canadian dollar was down slightly over the past 24 hours to $72.66 US. Recapping one of our top stories, it was day two of the trial of Anthony Olenek and Chris Carbert here in Lethbridge. The two men are being charged with a conspiracy to commit murder of RCMP officers back in 2022 during the Coots border blockade. The court heard the first full day of witness testimony, including RCMP Sergeant Greg Tulik, who acted as a liaison between the protesters. The trial will continue until the middle of July. You know, many people would argue that the role of the father is vital to the family unit. Coming up, we're going to chat with Rowan Crown, the lead pastor of Amazing Grace Community Church here in Lethbridge. We'll discuss how the role of the father has changed over the years, but is still very relevant. When you see news happening in your community, be sure to send us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. Also, be sure to visit our website anytime to check out a number of stories and interviews. Hollywood often portrays fathers as being a little goofy and sometimes not the sharpest knives in the drawer, which I believe is quite sad considering the powerful role that fathers play in society today. And according to our Heavenly Father, fatherhood is also very important when you read that in the Bible. Now to discuss this in more detail is Rowan Crown. He's the lead pastor of Amazing Grace Community Church here in Lethbridge. Pastor Rowan Crown, welcome back to Bridge City News. Thank you for having me, Hal. It's good to be here. 
So, Pastor Owen, many would agree that fathers play a very important role in the family dynamic. But sometimes, as dads, we do make mistakes. And those flubs can sometimes leave lasting hurts on our children. How can we really rebuild that relationship? Yeah, I first want to start off by saying that I do not come here as the number one example of a father. Uh, and it's important to, to know that we are people who make mistakes and I've failed as a father many times. So I think the first thing is, is recognizing our weaknesses as a father and, and how much we need the Lord and the Lord's guidance uh, as we are fathers to our children and really fathers to others or examples of fathers to others in our lives. So as dads, you talked about guidance from our Heavenly Father. How about wisdom as well, that we re really rely on God's Word and maybe seek more insight in His Word as a proper way of being a good father? Yeah, I think, Hal, I think it's a very difficult time in which we live in where the role of the father, as you said, by um, community examples or the examples in the world, that fathers are not looked upon as what scripture would really portray fathers as. And so it's, it's important that we look uh, to God's word. We look to the wisdom of God um, and the fear of the Lord in order to help us to walk humbly as fathers and allow his fatherhood in our lives to um, reflect and build in us that character so we can be those examples to those around us. Let's expand on that for just a moment here, Pastor Rowan. What do you see as the role for fathers today? I think the role of fathers today is, is to walk in humility, uh, to lead uh, confidently, and to really um, be those people who listen, who react in, in wisdom, um, but also are not afraid to um, love others and love their kids in a way that is, is helpful in, in, in guidance and, and so forth. It's easy right now in this day and age because the role of fathers has diminished in really a fatherless generation to kind of take the back burner in the lives of, of our kids and our children. Um, sometimes there's this uh, push to abdicate some of those leadership responsibilities, but really God calls us as fathers to be leaders, using the personalities and the gifts he's given us to be the leaders and examples uh, to those in, in our lives, especially our children. You know, I'm a father myself of two wonderful kids, Matthew and Carissa. They're adults now, obviously, and they're in their 20s. But I remember when they were younger, they were going down a certain path. I've been down that path. It led to destruction. It wasn't a good path. And I'm trying to encourage them and, and support them and love them, saying, guys, don't go down that path. I've been down that path. It's not a good path to go down. But as a father, sometimes you have to let go and let God and just let them learn, I guess. And, that, and that's what's really hard, I found, as a father, as a parent. Yeah, I'm, I'm learning that still, Hal, to be honest, is, is when to surrender our kids to the Lord, right? Uh, we, we desire for them to grow up in the fear and nurture the Lord. Uh, but there comes a time when we can't control our kids that we really need to leave them up to the Lord. I've had to do over the last actually year a lot of um, repenting to, to God and to my kids for um, things that I have de did or said to them unintentionally, but as they've gotten older, they've said, Dad, you did this to me, and, uh, uh, you know, that hurt me. And so I've had to do a lot of, lot of soul searching, a lot of going before the Lord and actually asking my kids for forgiveness for the ways in which I have I have treated them uh, in the past and asking the Lord to help me grow as a father as my kids grow older. Is there almost a kind of reconciliation that fathers have to have with their children, perhaps? Oh, ongoing reconciliation. <laughs> That's what relationships are, is, is, is that ongoing re reconciliation and so forth. But we also don't need to beat ourselves up because we, as fathers, often are doing the best we can with what we've given, what we've been given. And so it's important to remain humble and repentant, but also realize that 
we are not perfect and we fall short of those expectations. But to quickly remind ourselves that we can go to God for forgiveness and we can go to our kids in uh, and asking them to forgive us too. That's not showing weakness in a, in a sense that uh, we are weak people. That's actually showing a weakness in strength that we too need the Lord as we father those around us. And therefore, it's actually a strength. And there's, as as the Bible says, there's strength and weakness when we display that in a humble reliance upon the Lord. In my family, fathers traditionally were disciplinarians. You know, part of our job was to correct. But along with that, really encourage our children and teach them along the way. How successful of a formula do you think that is for today? Yeah, Hal, I would say this. I would say society and culture have changed a lot over the last 10, 20 years. Uh, the way I used to view uh, the role of a father in my life um, is has changed in, in a lot of ways. And, and it's changed somewhat for the good, but also there are dangers that we can easily fall into if we don't, if we don't remember uh, those things. And so, yes, traditionally, the father has been the disciplinarian in, in the role of, of the family. Um, somewhat that has changed, uh, where there's kids who grow up without fathers, they only have a single mom. And so that male authority can somewhat be a struggle for, for, for some. And so how do we humbly bring that role back into uh, the life of a family? It's, it's, it's difficult. And so uh, it's a learning stage for many fathers in our generation. How do we display God's goodness, God's grace, but also the, the love of God through godly love and discipline in, in the family? It is a very difficult time in which we live in. And so we have to err on the side of caution at times and, and, and be more encouraging and not demand that we have this authority, authoritative role in the lives of our kids, which has been looked upon now as, as a very bad thing. How do we show that authority, but also how do we show that with encouragement and, and humbly as well? That is, that is the challenge for us as fathers today. You know, Pastor Roa, many of us have never had the blessing of a father, and somehow I think we all long for our dads to say, you know, son, daughter, I'm so proud of you. You are so amazing, you know, lifting up your children. How important is that kind of validation for our kids? Oh, Hal, it is very, very important. For me as a, as a kid, that was so important to have my father's recognition, to have my father's love and verbal affirmation was was so important. I set my mission as a young father that I was going to do that. Um, have I always succeeded? No. But it's so important that as fathers, we are there for our kids, even and especially when they fall and fail and when they mess up. We need to be the first ones there to, to love and care for them during those difficult times. And to lift them up, absolutely. So Pastor Rowan, for fathers who are watching our program right now on Miracle Channel, Bridge City News, and have never actually done that, said, you know what, I'm really proud of you and I love you, they find it a little difficult. What advice would you give them to get started with that? I think it comes down to searching your own heart before the Lord, right? And, and, and really uh, turning to Him and um, confessing the way in which you have not been there for your children in that way. And it's, it's important because we have God, the father who loves us unconditionally. And so we can go to him with these things and, and then we can really ask the Lord to help us um, go to our kids, go to our children, make that phone call, um, admit our wrongdoing and our sin, and then ask others to hold us accountable. Um, in that process. I just had a father figure who just died suddenly this week in my life, uh, a mentor of mine. And the one thing about uh, him is that he always challenged me as a father. He always said, how are you seeking the Lord, Rowan? How are you seeking the Lord in, in front of your wife and your kids? 
And the memory of that still sticks with sticks with me today is that I need to be that example, that living example to my kids and the other children that are not my kids in my life that that look up to me as a father figure in in their life. You know, our condolences going out to you and your family with you losing your mentor. And let's talk about the importance of mentors as well, especially with maybe children who didn't grow up with a father but have that mentor, and that mentor can be a, a powerful, influential figure in that young person's life. Oh, definitely. I, I would say this. I would say every father, every male who's listening out here, if you don't have mentors or men in your life, that you can uh, bond with and talk about the things of the Lord, talk about your struggles, then it's going to be extra. It's going to be extra harder to to be the man that God has called you to be, and and you need that in your life. You need men challenging you and examples in your life, speaking into your life, calling out your stuff when you need to when it needs to be called out, and praying for you as you are doing the things that God has called you to do as a husband, as a father, as a worker, wherever you are, it is so, so important. I encourage every male who's listening out there to have some sort of mentor. You know, one of the most common complaints about father seems to be, my dad didn't spend a lot of time with me. He was always at the office, always working, always on the road. So Pastor Rowan, how important is it just to spend some quality time with your kids and really investing in them? Uh, it is it is so so important, and you'll fail. And they the, there are times when they will not like you being in their lives, and they will reject your wisdom. Uh, they laugh at me all the time. Every time they go out, I say, um, "Remember wisdom, remember wisdom." And they now joke about it uh, because they know I'm going to say it all the time. But it's important that we have that constant presence in their life. Because that's what God, our Father, is to, is to us. I'm preaching on Romans 8 this week. And it's a, it's a beautiful passage about the fatherhood of God in our lives, that he's our Abba Father, he's our Daddy. He's always present with us in the, in the Spirit. And so we can't be always present with them, but we can pray for them, seek the Lord for them, and remind them that we love them in a way that no one else has the opportunity to love them as a father in their lives. You know, many dads like to put on that real tough exterior, that macho image for their kids. But I wonder if it's more important to actually teach and model to our kids, like you mentioned earlier, to walk humbly, to take responsibility for our actions, and to really apologize when we mess up, say, you know, son, daughter, my bad, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, it's it's so, so important. I'm, I come from that old school how where fathers and i i actually had a father that i grew up with until i was 18 and then i moved to the states and lived with my uncle and then he became another father figure in my life and he was tough as nails and he 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 really uh taught me what it means to and and hold me accountable and and so i learned both sides of the coin uh in understanding that a father can be strong a father can, can can really be that strong leader in your life, but also a father needs to be humble. I still remember to this day when I made a major mistake and my uncle, who is, he's big and strong and, and man, he, he put the fear of God into you. But when I made that major mistake, he didn't scream at me and yell at me. He walked up to me and put his loving arms around me and cried over me. Uh, and I still remember that to this day, that um, it was so unexpected. And I just wept. <laughs> I just wept because that's what I needed. I needed a humble person to love me in my mistake. And that's what he did for me that day. How about thoughts on how we can best honor our fathers in a very meaningful way? Yeah, that is that is a great that is a great question. I have wrestled with that being a father, and even in my own struggles, in my own relationship, in understanding how I've responded to my father in in the past. So, so I think it's it's important for us to be thankful to God, regardless of what our fathers have done to us. 
right? Uh, that you may be out there and your father may have treated you very poorly in your life, but you can still be thankful uh, for them, right? And you can pray for them. And, and, and I think it's important that we honor them by remembering even the things that um, they did for us that may have been small, but now as a father, those small things, I look back and go, man, they weren't small. They were mighty things. My dad loved every person, a homeless person, an addict. Every time I walked with him in downtown Sydney, Australia, he would stop and talk to the alcoholic, right? I still remember that. And that was passed on to me. And there is not a homeless person that I do not meet, that I do not look in their eyes and say hello. I honor my father because he exemplified that for me growing up as a young man in Sydney, Australia. Roland Crown is the lead pastor of Amazing Grace Community Church here in Lethbridge. Pastor Roland, thanks so much for your time today. Thanks, Hal, for having me on on this very important topic and uh, the Lord's blessings on you and, and the program. Well, universal child care programs are seen by many as the answer to challenges faced by many working parents, and it's certainly being promoted that way by our federal government. But is it really the best solution? Well, today's guest isn't a fan of it. Joining us from Ottawa, the Ottawa area is Andrea Morzek, a senior fellow with the nonpartisan think tank Curtis. Andrea, thanks so much for being with us today to discuss this. Yes. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So, Andrea, you recently wrote an article in the National Post with the headline, National Daycare Program Builds Federal Monopoly at Expense of Parents. So can you maybe explain what you mean by that and how this is happening? Is it basically the government subsidies messing with the free market or what's going on? Yeah. Um, so the reason why we say that the new system is being built at the expense of parents is because so few parents have access to the type of care that the government is choosing to build. So um, generally in all of the provinces, each province is slightly different, but the funding for $10 a day daycare goes to licensed not-for-profit care. So across the country, you have a majority of parents who are not using that type of care. Um, in some cases, maybe they didn't have access. In other cases, um, equally, they didn't choose it, they didn't want it. So we basically see the government putting their finger on the scales and saying, this is the kind of care we are subsidizing. This is the kind of care you're gonna use, but that kind of care isn't available for all parents uh, with children under six, let alone children under the age of 12. So that's that's kind of what's happening with regards to the government choice in the new $10 a day childcare system. Right. Interesting. So what do you think the government is trying to achieve with these subsidies? I, I do think that initially, at least, it, it was about the cheaper child care. Um, I think they're quite enamored with the idea of European style systems. Um, there's reasons why those systems may work better in Europe than here. Um, a lot of that has to do with parental choice and the, the ways in which we view child rearing here and the diversity of care options that parents are currently choosing. But they're really bought into a model of a daycare system that I believe is out of date. And not um, It's just not fitting with what parents are doing. I know we all know someone uh, with three kids and they chose different care options for each child. And sometimes a different care option for the child, for one child, um, as they go through different ages. So um, I think the government wants this sort of European style system, if we could call it that, although Europe has a lot of different models, but we could get into that. Um, and, uh, and so they're choosing that at the expense of, of what Canadian parents would, would actually desire. Okay, and it sounds uh, very uh, confusing to have three kids in three different daycares. It sounds very, <laughs> very frustrating. I can just imagine I that care. household in the morning. But yeah, <laughs> and I mean, it's one thing to have affordable child care, right, which we're all for. But, you know, if there's a major shortage of these affordable child care spaces, then how much of a benefit is it to Canadian parents, really? Well, 
So when it comes to child care, we actually at Cardis define child care as the care of a child, no matter who does it. And that is a very broad definition. And it's one that is very inclusive. So you could have a mom doing no waged work at all. She's doing child care. You can have a mother doing full time waged work. And she's also doing child care. Let's be honest, at the beginning, at the end of her day. Um, so this is not about the mommy wars or saying we, we prefer uh, one particular course of action for parents. Um, it's really about enhancing parents' choices and acknowledging that people are doing different things and that um, those choices are legitimate, um, more than legitimate, it's actually what parents want. So we have this broad definition of childcare. The government has a very, very, very limited definition of childcare. And by that, I mean not even recognizing um, paid childcare on the ground as it exists today. So licensed childcare is just a section, just a, a percentage of all of the um, professional child care that, that parents are accessing. Um, a lot of parents will be choosing unlicensed day homes, for example, for the geographic proximity. There's a lot of reasons why parents make different choices for their child care needs. Yeah, uh, definitely, definitely. Uh, now, uh, why are so many private child care providers unhappy with these government subsidies? Yeah, um, a lot of them signed on with the, you know, definitely appreciating the cheaper child care that parents were supposed to be getting. I think they're mostly upset because they've been put in the position of intermediary or unpaid accountants, basically, for the system. So there's a lot of bureaucratic work that goes along with navigating the new um, grants that bring down the cost of child care. I do know child cares who have had to hire a person to navigate the grants um, and uh, the um, applications and the different hoops they have to jump through. Um, so it's extremely bureaucratically onerous. I think that comes through as, as a major reason. And the governments across the country and in Alberta haven't uh, acknowledged the amount of work that is for child cares. And the government's also been fairly unpredictable in how they've navigated the new system. So, for example, um, child cares have been asked to sign on to something that basically ensures their viability as a business. Um, but they've been given like a weekend, for example, to read through reams and reams of paperwork. So I think we can all see how that would be very frustrating, taxing, and difficult for small child cares who are in the business, not because they love paperwork, but because they love children. Yeah, that could potentially cause a lot of problems for sure. So what does the research say about the quality of care in government funded daycare as compared to say family care at home? So just to be clear, all daycare is government funded to a greater or lesser extent, but what you're getting at there is the quality question. And so um, at Cardis, we are really concerned with all of the types of childcare, and that's not something that we've really studied fully in Canada. The biggest, best um, peer reviewed study that we have that included thousands of participants over um, years, like a decade plus is from the United States. And it found that center-based care um, ranked the lowest quality on uh, various choices, um, and they did attempt to contrast with every form of, of non-maternal, so basically anything that wasn't the mom, could include dads, grandparents, etc., um, and they found the quality of care in centers was, was the lowest. There's a lot of caveats I'd put on that. There is good quality center-based care, but I think that as we funnel more and more kids in that direction, it gets increasingly difficult to fulfill quality requirements because um, you're pushing more kids into it. There will be pressure to perhaps change ratios, which is one of the quality aspects, right? Yeah, the, the pressure would be to have more kids per staff member, for example, simply to accommodate more people. Um, that immediately lowers the quality. So I would simply say on that question, we're just not having a very um, robust quality discussion in Canada mm -hmm. at the moment. Do you know what the percentages of kids that stay at home with their parents compared to the number of kids that, that go out of home for daycare? Yeah, so at a bare minimum, it's 40% of um, kids under six are with their parents. Um, that's a bare minimum because of different factors in the data. Um, for example, when they count kids as using childcare, they'll count kids using preschool, but preschool is something that happens at an extremely part-time basis, maybe two hours a day, three days a week. That might be a preschool program. So a preschool kid is essentially also home with parents, um, but they get counted as using childcare. So 40% would be, I think, a, a bare minimum of kids at home with their parents. 
Okay, interesting. And what percentage of child care operators are government funded as compared to purely private child care businesses? Yeah, I tried to allude to this earlier on. I, I don't believe there's any purely private. I think um, the $10 a day system that we have now is the latest, greatest funding grant. It is the largest for sure, and it's been consolidated via legislation into a system. However, all daycares were using various grants, I think, before for something like space creation, even if it was a private operator. Um, so it's a it's been a long, slow drip of government money to get to the point of the $10 a day system. Um, I think that daycare is expensive and that's the nature of the business. There's no real efficiencies that you could build in because you're dealing with children. Um, so yeah, I think daycares, private or not-for-profit, have been using government grants and subsidies for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, do we know what the actual need or demand is for low-cost childcare? Like, is, is that at the top of the list of priorities for parents, or would they rather use other options to care for their children? So we are definitely the people who see that um, big picture, a big ecosystem of care and a preference for using other, other forms of care. If you listen exclusively to the mainstream media, you could be forgiven for thinking that there is a huge shortage, um, a huge demand for care. Um, in certain markets, that may be true. Um, even in the same market, in a large urban center, you may find places where there's a shortage in one area and then a surplus of spaces in another. I personally have done research into revealing surplus childcare spaces in markets where we were told there were absolutely none. So um, it's a tricky thing. I don't think that parents are clamoring though for exclusive center-based care. What they are um, interested in is help with their childcare needs. And that could come in the form of money to parents. It could come in the form of um, tax reductions, et cetera. But there's a lot of different options and a lot of different levers that we're kind of not using when we turn towards this, this uh, system that the government's chosen. Mm -hmm. Now, Andrea, it seems that part of the liberal government universal child care goal is to see more women enter the workforce. So is this program, you know, is it, it's forking out $30 billion on this. So are we actually seeing a significant increase in women joining the workforce because of this? Yeah, that was one of the reasons was put forward for having this system um, was to increase the number of mothers of young children who would be doing waged work and that would increase the GDP and, and help the economy, more workers, et cetera. Um, I don't think we see that kind of influx into the workforce. Um, the, in English Canada, um, every province but Quebec, you already had a fairly, fairly high number of um, mothers in the workforce. Um, there was a kind of a theory that we could do what Quebec did. Quebec, when they introduced their program of uh, a system of early learning and childcare um, almost 20 years ago, they uh, did see an influx of women into the workforce. Um, but that was because they had a lower percentage of mothers doing waged work to start with. And English Canada, the rest of Canada didn't actually uh, share those percentages. So to tease up that percentage is difficult. There's been a recent study just very concretely saying the $30 billion has been allocated to this child care program without budging that number at all. So I tend to think that would be, you know, intuitively in my gut that that really resonates. It's going to be hard to do that with an already percentage of women already working. Yeah. So is it a flaw then that the government seems to be favoring only the one option? Would it be better maybe to make a variety of options available? Well, certainly these agreements need to be made very much more flexible and, and I mean, immediately as they renegotiate the next round or the next five years, we need to see vastly more um, flexibility incorporated. We need to see um, private care included. It's absolutely essential that all forms of care be included. And we would say that ultimately parents and family members can also be in, a, uh, in providing child care. And as such, funding the parents is an extremely effective and uh, efficient way of ensuring that everybody um, can access the, the billions of dollars that currently the very few are actually getting. Mm -hmm. uh, what, if, if, it, if you were in charge, what kinds of options could they make available to parents that might be better, do you think? Well, I mean, what we've seen, I think, in many of the moves of the government is that they're steamrolling over 
this ecosystem of care. So um, for example, smaller providers are finding it hard to stay afloat with the current funding model. It's just not easy for them to navigate all of the bureaucratic ho hoops and still stay in business. Um, so as for, I don't personally believe that it's the role of government to ensure particular forms of care are available. I think the most equitable way of allowing parents to access money is to give parents the money and then allow for them to access care in their local communities that works for them. And it might even be a parent in the home. Um, that's not quite the same thing as saying government should provide X, Y, or Z it would be a bit more organic than that. But certainly um, the option to have the cheaper childcare is not available right now for, as we discussed, the majority of uh, families. And that strikes me as being extremely unfair. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, at the top there, you were mentioning that the federal government's kind of modeling uh, against the, the European system. So with that said, are there any other countries around the world who have a better child care system in place that we could potentially learn from? Yeah, well, we've always, you know, we have taken some time to study the systems in Europe, and they are different. So it's not fair, actually, I said European style daycare. That's not really fair. Um, models that we appreciate more if you were to look at Finland over and above Sweden, for example, so Sweden had this idea of um, basically more, I f it feels like Canada is following more of a Swedish path where all children go to one type of care. Uh, in Finland, you had more funds available so parents could choose childcare or taking cash to be at home. And that was, a, I, I think it's available for the first three years of a child's life. Um, so again, any system in Europe that has a greater degree of flexibility um, so Finland over Sweden, that's one thing I can point to very concretely. Um, each European country has their own slightly different approach. And one of the reasons why it's uh, European anything is difficult in Canada is because we're not Europe. I think English Canada has a vastly different tradition and culture that we're coming from. And so it makes emulating these types of programs all the more difficult. But if we do uh, go down the path of creating a system, then it, we should max out on the flexibility for Canadian parents. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like we are very close to being out of time here, but Andrea, thank you so much for being with us today. Appreciate having you on. Yeah, thanks for having this conversation. Absolutely. Andrea Mrozek is a senior fellow with the Think Tank at Cardis. I'm Jeanette Roche on behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News. Thanks so much for watching.